Okay, here we go then. <coughs> Chapter 2. The Hotel de Trip Skulls. As Jimmy approached the door of the gadgets division, he could hear a muffled grunting sound. Two! Three! Jimmy knocked on the door and the voice could be heard louder. 998! Come in! 999! Jimmy opened the door and was met with the sight of Elp Meme lying on a bench, lifting two five-kilogram dumbbells while wearing a full black gimp suit. Elp was, according to Calcium Kaz, the best and only gadgets guy in the whole of Team Fantastic. As Jimmy walked in, Elp dropped the weights on the floor with a small thud and sat up. Ah, oh, Jimmy, he said. You just caught me during my morning workout. Well, actually, my second workout, know what I mean. But yeah, I'm just throwing up some big numbers. Been working on it, and it's starting to see the results already. I see, said Jimmy. Elp cut in. Yeah, I know what you're here for, Jim. Elp stood up, creaking in the gimp suit. Elp, asked Jimmy. Yeah, Jim, asked Elp. Why on earth are you wearing a gimp suit? Elp unzipped the suit slightly and took off the face mask. Well, Jim, it's my latest invention. Here you're witnessing the next stage in gimp suit filing cabinet gadgetry, merging the storage of a gimp suit with the tightness of a filing cabinet. Elp paused. Or something like that. Jimmy nodded. I see. Well, can I collect what I need from you, please, Elp? My flight leaves in about three hours. Of course, Jim, said Elp. Reaching inside his suit, he pulled out a handful of items. Amazing storage in this thing. Right, Jim, here are your gadgets. Two rosters, laminated. He handed them to Jimmy. One high elf team, skill rings attached, painted a tabletop standard with a minimum of three unique colours. Jimmy took the box. And finally your dice, said Elp, fishing in the suit. Now, he continued, there are two sets of dice here, Jim. One is an ordinary set of blood bowl dice, but these, he said, holding up a set of red and gold dice, are my new invention. A set of D6 that will only roll sixes, and a set of three block dice that will only roll pows. Elp held them up to Jimmy so he could see them. Jimmy nodded. But, said Elp, I'd suggest not using them until the absolute critical moment in the game, or you might get fined out and called out on a Discord server or something. <laughs> Jimmy took the warm dice bag. Cheers, Elp. He turned to leave the room. Hold on, Jim, said Elp. Anything else I can help you with? A little something for the trip? Some roids? A marital aid? You name it, mate, I have it. No, thank you, said Jimmy, and he walked out the room. As he moved down the corridor, he heard a crash from the gadget division, a momentary pause, then Elp meme crying out for his assistant. Elp von Elder, I'm stuck under the bench! <laughs> Jimmy didn't turn around. <laughs> Jimmy's trip to Monte Carlo was much as one would expect. Queues at the airport, delayed flight, crying baby on the plane, and overpriced alcohol. Team Fantastic didn't believe in wasting money on luxury items, let alone first-class tickets. When Jimmy landed, he collected his bag, 50 pounds extra at check-in because it was oversized, and made his way out into the terminal. As he gazed around, a beautiful lady caught his eye. She was holding a sign saying, J. Ventura. Jimmy moved towards her. Hello, said Jimmy. Mr. Ventura, asked the lady in a voice as smooth as whipped cream. Yup, replied Jimmy. I'm Pushes. Pushes galore. She continued, I'm here to take care of you and provide you with the Cans you need for the entry. Jimmy nodded. I can see Anne why they chose you for the task, he said. Pushes ignored the pun and handed him an envelope. Mr. Fantastic, this was sent from the Team Fantastic HQ for you. Jimmy opened the envelope. On it was typed the following words. Forgot to mention 007 Toes. You'll be joined by an American agent. He's playing in the tournament too. He'll introduce, you to, uh, he'll introduce himself to you at the right time. S. Jimmy folded the paper in half and pocketed it in his suit. Have you got transport? he asked. Oh yes, Mr. Ventura. No expense spared on our side. When you deal in Cianne's, doors open for you, Pushes said, and gestured to the airport car park. Shall we? As the reliant Robin fell on its side, scraping the paintwork for the fourth time in as many minutes, Jimmy wondered what kind of vehicle they would have collected him in if expense had been spared. Luckily, Pushes called out to him, pressed against the glass on the driver's side. This is the hotel here. Heaving himself out through the skywards pointing door, Jimmy climbed out. Thank you, he said. Are you staying here too? He asked with a hint of interest in his voice. Sadly not, Mr. Ventura. Uh, Pusher said. But I'll be back in the morning to pay the entry fee and support you during the tournament. Jimmy nodded, then pulled the car back onto its three wheels. 
I'll see you in the morning, then. He took his oversized suitcase from the back seat and then shut the door. Stay fantastic, he whispered as he watched her drive away. Tomorrow would be an eternity coming without her by his side. Jimmy ascended the steps of the Hotel de Trip Skulls, the suitcase banging on every step, and pushed his way through the revolving door. A large green lobby opened before him, and Jimmy made his way towards the welcome desk. A small man stood behind it and greeted Jimmy as he approached. Bonjour, monsieur. Welcome to le Hotel de Trip Skulls. Jimmy smiled and responded. Murky, le plimplon plou. The man behind the desk's face lit up. Oh, monsieur, you speak French, magnifique. Oui, le plimplon plou, responded Jimmy. He thought back to his Eton days and how proud the French schoolmaster would be of him right now conversing in a second language. Plimplon plou, uh, monsieur fantastic. But you might have me down as Ventura, le plimplon plou, continued Jimmy. The man behind the desk beamed. Oui, monsieur Ventura. But I must say, sir, your French is, uh, how you say, like your name, fantastique. He handed Jimmy a room key, room 358. Jimmy thanked him, le plim plom plou, and walked off to the elevator, wheeling his case behind him. Once in the room, Jimmy showered, wanked, took a 40-minute nap, had a tea and a wee, and then prepared himself for dinner. He dressed smartly in one of the eight suits he had packed and made his way to the hotel restaurant. A crisply dressed waiter led him, uh, led him to a small table overlooking a small stage where the famous singer Hellboy was crooning to the sound of a piano. The hotel de Trip Skulls knew how to entertain. As the bars of Blood Bowl-themed parodies floated through the air, the waiter returned to take Jimmy's order. I'll have the chicken and rice, said Jimmy, with red peppers on the side and a bottle of wine. Red, too. The waiter looked embarrassed. I'm sorry, sir, we don't serve red wine here, only Budweiser. As Jimmy was about to speak, the maitre demi G, owner of the Hotel de Trip Skulls, walked over to the table. All right, Mr. Ventura, said the maitre demi G. Franco, piss off, I'll take his one. He's a special guest. Dimmy took the notepad from the waiter. So, chicken and rice, nice, good pick. Shell in the kitchen will do him good and proper. But, uh, red peppers? Mr. Ventura, mate, green peppers are where it's at, mate. Look, I'll throw them in as complimentary. Jimmy cut him off. No, thank you. Red. Uh, but I'll take a Budweiser, he said, trying to ease the horror on the maitre demi G's face. Uh, bottled, not canned. He added as an afterthought. He added as an afterthought. We only have cans, said the maitre demi G. Jimmy sighed quietly. Uh, then a can will be fine. Dimmy nodded and walked off, still slightly stunned from the pepper incident. Oh, God, thought Jimmy. Here he was in the Hotel de Trip Skulls, about to engage in a Blood Bowl tourna tournament versus one of the world's most dangerous criminals, and his preparation would involve a can of Budweiser and possibly green peppers. He shut his eyes. The sound of Mr. Tato played at the piano floated through the air, and Jimmy smiled. Perhaps it wasn't going to be such a bad night after all. He let his thoughts linger on pushes galore. He sighed again. Just got to get through tomorrow, he thought. Then he could enjoy the rest of the weekend, hopefully, in her company. The music continued playing, and Franco returned, cracking open the can of Budweiser for Jimmy. Jimmy thanked him and took a sip. He let the taste linger on his lips for a moment, then smiled again. This was going to be fine. Jimmy took another sip. Behind him, sat in the shadow of a secluded corner, a man wrote something down on a piece of paper, his eyes never leaving the back of Jimmy's head. There you go. That's the end of chapter two. Thank you very much. Very good. <laughs> <laughs>